But uh, yeah, take it away, David. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't have time to go and redo my slides after Ken's talk. So we'll just have to make do with what I've got. Hopefully, I don't show me too many things that we're doing that he says we shouldn't be. Um, I'm, what I'm talking about is how Alan Gray moved from a monolithic architecture to microservices over about, well, five years since the very first step. And all the things that we learned on the way, the problems we didn't expect that we hit, um, and generally just you know, what happened. Um, one thing we, we realized, well, I realized putting the slide together is that, you know, I initially said monolithic microservices, great catchy title. In fact, there's a big part of continuous delivery thrown in there as well. Um, it, it seems to be very hard, if not impossible, to really do microservices effectively without continuous delivery featuring somewhere in it. Um, so, fair amount of that as well. That's just a picture of our building. As I said, I'm from Ellen Gray. It's a slightly unusual picture, and it's taken from the seaside. Um, I think there was someone from Alan Gray last year who did a talk and showed the front view. So since everyone's seen that, I thought I'd show a different view. Uh, Alan Gray is a... Drop. Alan Gray is a... <coughs> drop of water. I'll try again. Alan Gray is a, is a corporate um, in the sort of strict sense, but it's a bit unusual. It's, Working there doesn't feel like a corporate. We don't have the typical constraints one associates with corporates. Um, we don't have a, a sort of corporate governance that says we must make lots of money and tech as a side thing. Uh, it's actually almost opposite. It's very tech-focused. Um, from the top down, the focus is to do tech and do it properly as well, not just throw something together and hope it works. Uh, so the, the sort of constraints we have are not, not what one associates with, with corporate. Um, there are a few things. We, we host everything on premises. Um, there's various legislative reasons for that. It's just very difficult for us to actually go into the cloud. Um, so I mean, that's, that's one of the biggest challenges we have with this sort of, this sort of thing, microservices. And so on. The, the usual answer is slap it in the cloud, and we can't. Um, I'm, I'm in the delivery engineering team, which most people recognize as sort of the equivalent of Google's SRE, Site Reliability Engineering. Uh, so, so I've been involved with the majority of this work directly. Um, most of what we do is setting up the pieces of infrastructure and figuring out how we're going to be you know, delivering continuously, that sort of thing. <clears throat> So, monolith, this is where we, we started. We had a monolith, 2013, it looked a lot like that. Big, solid, nobody really knows what sort of traps might be inside. Um, you're always worried if you sort of take a corner in the code, you might come across some code that really should be dead, but is moving around. <laughs> and it was all .NET, big .NET slapped on the front. Um, Typical deployment was happens every three happened every three months. Uh, there was a it was a big thing, sort of big orchestration, big pipelines um, for it, sort of go through the the cycles one associates with it. Uh, copy files onto servers, restart IIS, copy more files, restart IIS again. Doesn't work. Try something else. Figure out it's a database thing we forgot about. You know, big, problematic. So this is just a, a, a short timeline of the, the first few steps. The first step in 2013 wasn't actually microservices at all. It was the need to start processing things asynchronously. There was third-party integrations, which were sometimes offline. Um, there was, it had just reached that level of scale where asynchronous processing was becoming fairly vital just to be able to you know, handle transactions. Um, and at that point in time, the .NET environment was just, just didn't really have much in the way of you know, RabbitMQ integration or anything similar. So we started moving over, still as a fairly monolithic code base, 
onto Java, running on Ubuntu, RabbitMQ. We started migrating from SVN to Git through Nginx, and all of that was aimed purely towards being able to go, go asynchronous. 2015 was when the, the microservices, I could really say, started. Um, it was the first conscious decision that we are going to do microservices. There was a whole lot of new website work going on, and we thought new, new APIs needed. Let's do microservices. Anyone can do microservices. They're easy. So we started doing microservices, deployed via Ansible, a big deployment script, because that's the way to deploy microservices. 2016, we started looking at Docker, and um, we had React on the front end, which um, it, it was a, a whole new part of the project where we needed to do a whole lot of front end work, new teams were being spun up, and we started taking our big Debian files that we were building and turning them to big Docker files that we were building. The bit that I think is most interesting is actually the bit between then when we had this sort of the, the first stages of what was going to become a microservice architecture to now when we have something that I think we can actually call a microservice architecture. And it was in that period that we started to hit the like, difficult questions and, and really have to think about how we're going to do this. So at that point, this is roughly what we had. We had a, a big monolith still on the side. We had the starts of a microservice front end running in Docker. Um, some microservice backends <coughs> running on Ubuntu. And then a bunch of third party things, there's third party systems that, I mean, those aren't going to go away. There's, uh, there's big underlying uh, systems that we have. Um, and a database, or a couple of databases. The database, th this isn't just a, you know, a quick spun up thing with a big ORM in front of it. We're talking about databases with sort of millions or thousands of tables, similar number of stored procs. So, I mean, that's, a, that's another whole discussion that I'll come to towards the end. So, that's when we said, well, microservices, it's easy. We write some Java, Scala stuff. We stick it in a Docker file. We stick it in our big deploy script, and we run it. And we do this once a month, and we have microservices. I'll do the air quotes. Microservices. This, obviously... Lots of problems. So that's, this is the, the start of the, the, first, the first real question we had. Our big Ansible script, how do we turn that into a real pipeline? How do we actually start building these things? The, the design of a pipeline is well documented. Um, I think this particular picture comes from ThoughtWorks. You start out by building some things, it all fans in, we package it, you know, run tests, fan out, fan in, all the catchphrases, put it into production. <clears throat> so, great, we've got all our microservices, we build them all, we fan into a whatever, you know, whatever that would be, fan out again to do our tests, deploy it, it'll work great. So we started looking at how we could do it. At that point in time, we were on Jenkins. Um, now, Jenkins is very versatile. It can do just about anything with the right plugins. But pipelines are not really its strong area. We even looked at Jenkins 2, which claims to have pipelines. Um, I don't know if it's changed, but when we looked at it, the pipelines were yet another plugin that it was the same, same thing underneath. Um, we also looked at GoCD from ThoughtWorks, which definitely does do pipelines because they're the ones who say we should be doing pipelines. Um, Bamboo is another, another one we looked at. Um, it's an Atlassian product. It doesn't really do pipelines. It does have the idea of builds and deployments as separate things that are staged. All three of them had, had one problem. None of them really treated the pipelines as code, which is something we said we wanted to do. We wanted to be able to manage our build and deploy pipelines in the same way we manage our code. And since the previous iteration of what we had was Ansible, we were already doing that. To go back to something that's all configured through a UI and we've got to try and keep track of was, 
not really ideal. Um, GoCD gave us, I think, the best option there because you, you, you could manage it through XML files, but um, nobody really wants to work with XML after YAML. So that was a good enough reason not to. We then discovered Concourse. I don't know if anyone's ever found, uh, seen Concourse. Um, it's, a, it's really quite a, a beautiful piece of machinery. You can build these massive pipelines. It has all the fan-ins and fans out that, that we wanted to be doing. Um, things happen, lights flash, things blink, things go red. Looks, looks great. There were two big problems we, we had with it, though. The first was all the examples and documentation and stuff talked about how you'd model one or two pipelines. We had 50 microservices, so we wanted at least 50 pipelines, and with a whole lot of stuff going on. Um, what we found is that it just didn't scale to that, to that level. Um, I think looking back on it, there were, there were some things that we probably could have done different, but um, nonetheless, that, that was a problem. Um, part, of the, part of the reason was that it, everything runs in containers, which is great. But it doesn't run in Docker. It runs on their own implementation of a container engine with their own tooling. So unless you know that very well, it's just about impossible to debug it. The second big problem was that once we had built all these big, complicated pipelines with microservices coming in and going out, we realized that wasn't what we wanted. Certainly for us, the, the big pipelines that are orchestrated was a complete anti-pattern. We wanted to be able to deploy things when they were ready, on their own, without worrying about waiting for everything to come into a big deployment that would you know, happen once a month, as we were doing. Um, I think that our interpretation of ThoughtWorks diagram was perhaps not quite accurate. We were seeing it as the entire thing gets built fans in, fans out, does all the clever stuff, and then gets deployed. We actually wanted to do that on a microservice scale, which meant we needed much simpler pipelines, but a lot more of them. After that, GitLab just descended from a cloud. That's after, after, after restarting concourse every morning when things were broken, that's really what it felt like. We deployed GitLab using their sort of one-click deploy thing, and it just worked. We had pipelines, it was YAML files, it was all linked to the repository, it was just, just what we wanted. So that's what we're using at the moment. That was that question pretty much answered. The next thing was where do we deploy? We had, this, we had these pipelines, we could deploy to our, our Ubuntu Docker servers, we could generate Docker Compose files from you know, Ansible templates or whatever we were doing at that point. But you know that that doesn't do much. We wanted service discovery, config management, all those all those things one associates with sort of you know a microservice architecture. <clears throat> so the answer: write a lot of Bash. We've got our Docker servers there ready. We just write a lot of Bash to you know do those things to do service discovery and self healing and everything else. At um, about. 3,000 lines of bash, we realized maybe we were on slightly the wrong track. <laughs> so we upgrade to Docker Swarm, throw a console in. Traffic is a distributed load balancer um, that does service discovery. All these are nice separate pieces that do their own thing quite well. So we need a whole lot of bash to, to orchestrate it and keep them in sync and make sure they're doing the right things at the right time. At another 3,000 or so lines of bash, we realized we were building Kubernetes. <laughs> so <laughs> at that point, we said, well, let's just use Kubernetes. We had sort of resisted it because we were on-premises. Deploying Kubernetes to the cloud is a, is a bit of an undertaking. Doing it when you've got to actually you know, build the underlying servers yourself was scary. Um, so we, we had sort of just said, Let, we don't need to do that. We can write Bash. When we actually did it, though, it was, you know, it was a big project. It 
took several months to get the whole thing up and running to the point where we were satisfied it was actually stable. Um, even now, there's bits and pieces we sort of think, well, you know, if we just change it this way, we could just that much better, which I think a lot of that you just get for free in the cloud. Um, uh, but it was, it was definitely a worthwhile investment. That just solved all of those problems. We now had service discovery on tap. Self-healing just happened. If a, if a service went down, it would come up again. We didn't have to worry about it. Um, config was managed for us. We had all the stuff that Kubernetes gives us. So this was now roughly our architecture. We had a little bit of monolithic stuff going on. Our front end microservices running on Kubernetes. We still, we had our builds orchestrated, but we still had a monolithic deploy. And we had a distributed monolith, which is exactly where we wanted to end up. Two big reasons. Uh, that we had our big monthly deploys that happened. The one was tightly coupled client libraries and a lot of shared code. And all of that was, I mean, that, that was part of the reason for the single deploy script. The title cu coupled libraries came about from the, the way we actually broke apart our big code base. The, the approach we took was we had, a, you know, we had a big code base, there were little modules, we got to the point where each of them could be distribute, could be deployed as a, as a microservice that had a, a REST interface. And each of them, it, this was a, a, a JVM platform, it was written in Scala. Each of them had these nice little strongly typed models and um, client libraries that could just, people could just use. The other part of it was as a monolith, there's a lot of code that's shared. There's, you know, the bit that does serialization is a central piece, and the bit that integrates with the database is another central piece. And all of those were in a common library. So developers love dry code. Dry, don't repeat yourself, anyone who doesn't know. If there's any bits of code that are being rewritten, we must, we must put that in a library. We must go put it in a common place. And what we realized this was, was actually a big problem with the microservice. We, we didn't want dry code because that meant a lot of centralized libraries that everyone had to coordinate around and make sure they were using in a consistent way. We wanted wet code. <laughs> that's, a, that's a picture of our wet code. It's exactly like that. So I mean that that's that's a that's still still part of part of what we're working on at the moment is trying to get to our wet code. Um, it's a it's a big refactoring ex exercise that's going to be around for a while. Next big question: trunk-based development. Do we really have to? And uh, yes, we do really have to. When we started out, we were using Gitflow. Gitflow is a is a, a pattern for for using Git repos that involves a lot of branching. Um, it was exactly what we needed for our big orchestrated deploys because it meant that we could, we could do our work on one branch and have our release on another branch. And if we had a patch, that was on a separate branch. And it's all dictated by this diagram. And we knew exactly what to, had to happen when and in order for the right bits of code to end up in the right environment at the right time. The trouble is, if we want to be deploying regularly, continuously, um, hourly, it meant that every, just about every commit, we would have to merge across this way, branch this way, branch back that way, try and remember which one we were actually meant to be doing at which point in time. There's tools that help you with it, but it's still it's confusing and complicated. And what you actually end up with is really every commit on every branch all the time. And yeah, so I mean, GitFlow really is just the wrong paradigm for that. It works great when you're trying to, to orchestrate a monthly release, but when you're doing it daily or hourly, it's just the wrong approach. The trouble was at that point we were doing monthly releases. We still had to have something like this just to keep the code we were hacking on separate from the code that we knew was production ready. So we, we had a compromise. 
we said we're going to do our work on a master branch, but when we hit the code freeze point and have to now think about what's going into this month's release, we branch off, give it a name, and those two are separate. And um, it's not ideal, but it's a good stepping stone to being able to say, well, uh, now we, we, don't, we don't need to be doing this monthly, we can do it weekly or daily, and actually we don't need that extra branch anymore because we know what we're doing on this and we know we're not gonna be doing new features in the next hour before we put this thing in production. So it was a, it was a, a stepping stone that's easy to, to get past when we reach that point. The second thing that um, is particularly tru trouble, troublesome is what about versioning? There are a lot of different versioning strategies I've read about for microservices. The, the, the popular take seems to be once you've written a microservice, that is the version. You're never going to touch it again. If there's a change to be made, that's a new microservice. And I think that can work well in certain environments. Um, it didn't really work in ours. Um, at some point in the future it might, but we were still trying to break apart this thing. We still had tight dependencies in places that had to be kept. And the biggest thing is we still had a lot of the mentality of a monolithic uh, culture which says, we've got this thing that does most of it, let's just add a piece to that. And that's not something you're just gonna change overnight. So the approach we ended up taking was semantic versioning strictly applied according to you know, the strict documentation on it. There was a tool we discovered called Semantic Release. I don't know if anyone's seen it. Um, it was a JavaScript project. I think it was started about two or three years ago. Um, it, it goes through, the idea is you run it on every build or every uh, frequently. And it goes through, looks at your commit history, and based on certain prefixes says, well, this must be version 3.0. Um, the, the big advantage of that is it means that when you're coding, you can think at a commit level, does this break things or not? You don't have to try and look back and say, well, what have I done for the last month? Did I break anything? I can't remember. I hope not. Let's just say this is version 2.1 and go for it. Um, semantic release itself, um, I looked at it while, while setting up this, and it's, it's come a long way since it did when we first looked at it is now at the point where anybody considering going this route, I'd strongly recommend taking a serious look at it. Um, when we started, though, it was, it was JavaScript only, and we had a lot of Scala specifically and other languages. It also assumed certain things about your workflow. It kind of made the assumption that you were doing trunk-based development and couldn't really handle complicated branching strategies. Um, so we ended up just implementing our own. The algorithm is quite complicated, but it's not particularly big, so it, it worked out fine. And that meant we had, we had this. On our release branches, we could have one set of numbering. When, we, when that release branch happens, we go up by a, a feature number on the main development branch, and we didn't have any number clashes. It required a bit of um, rigor in the way we do branching, but since we didn't want to be doing that long term anyway, that was, that's okay. Related to that, how do we deploy reliably and specifically what about version dependencies? So that dealt with how we actually attach a version number to a microservice. How do we make sure that we've got the versions we want? Kubernetes does a, a very good job of, of abstracting all the, all the bits about your application that actually do the work. It gives you a nice, a nice sort of I don't want to say container because that's the wrong, <laughs> gives the wrong impression, but a sort of wrapper around, around your, your application. It's, it'll set up the you know, DNS and um, IP addresses and everything for you, but it doesn't do much for the, the environment that that is running in. So what, what we ended up doing was actually just writing a little light wrapper around kubectl apply that would do that. It would say, well, you need version whatever of these five things, I'm gonna make sure that those are in the environment in the right state before we even try to do the deployment. Um, part of this, this, this tool has the concept of deploy plans where we can say that 
for this thing to get deployed, we must first run the, deep, the database migrations. We must then actually deploy the, the thing. Um, we must also make sure that these other things are, are around in advance. Um, once again, the idea, of, the idea of doing things in a sequence kind of goes against what Kubernetes uh, advocates. But you know, when you're moving from a microservice and you've got a long orchestrated deployment process, which you know, you know that you've first got to make sure that service is up because everything will break if it's not. And we must then make sure our database is in the right state because everything will break if it's not. You can't immediately jump to, well, everything just happens at the same time, it'll be fine. Next one was how do we run our test environments? With a, a monolith, you tend to have a monolithic environment. You've got your integration testing environment. And when you reach that point in your release cycle, everything gets deployed to that environment. And you, you do the builds, you do the tests, and you know how, how that environment behaves because it's, it's handcrafted and carefully managed. And it's, it's going to work the way, the way you, you've set it up. If you want to do continuous delivery, you need to do that for every commit just about. You need to have to be able to spin up these environments as soon as, as, soon as you, you're ready to, to run the tests. And that's, a, that's quite a big change. What happened was with that, that um, tool we had, we had really written for, for doing deployments, is we could very easily extend that with the idea of the deploy plans to say, well, here's a plan for running tests. And for this plan, we're going to do it in this new namespace. And instead of just making sure that we've got these uh, dependencies available, we're actually going to deploy them. <clears throat> and then once it's all up, and, we've, and Kubernetes has told us it's all running, we're going to run our tests, which is just a Kubernetes job. And when it's all finished, we'll just delete it. And that just worked surprisingly well. Um, the database. I said I'd come back to this. I was sort of hoping that the slider just you know, vanished while, while I wasn't looking. It's the, it's the big problem. The, the, the code is easy. Anyone can, well, it's just easy. It's still, uh, uh, comparatively easy. Um, it's fairly easy to, to break apart code, refactor it, and you know, just replace what's there with what's new. The database actually has data in it. You can't just do that. <laughs> You've got to think about how you're going to get the data from one state to another. And when the database has a whole lot of stored procs, which are somewhere between data and code, um, that becomes a lot more complicated. Stored procs typically aren't tested either. Um, I, I'm not really a database expert. As far as I know, there isn't a way of really writing unit tests for stored procs. Um, I'm sure the DBA would, would have a way, but mo I think most developers don't. Um, it's hard. And hard problems we just don't deal with because they're hard. <clears throat> the best we've come up so far with um, to deal with the, 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 the monolithic database and uh, by the way, this also goes for things like third-party systems, which you can't really touch. You've got this integration with a, you know, a big monolithic system that's been purchased 10 years ago and we can't possibly get rid of because nobody knows how it works. Um, our approach so far is to just try and isolate it as, pos as far as possible. Write an API that sits in front of it and handles everything that, that goes to it. Um, don't add anything new to it, rather do that you know, the, the correct way in microservice databases. Um, there's still a lot of problems associated with that, and that, I think, is really the next big thing that we need to, to try and tackle, is how, how do we do this better than that? But with, with, with just, I, just with that, it means that you know, you obviously can't deploy your microservice database, uh, sorry, your monolithic database every time you spin up this new environment in Kubernetes. But if you can stub it out, then that, that goes a long way to, to helping. <clears throat> 
So the lessons we've learned along the way. Um, the first one is versioning strategy. I think it was one of the early things that we, we really got right the first time, and we've seen how much it's helped along the way. Not necessarily following our strategy, but just having a strategy. Um, there's several times when we said, oh, wouldn't it, be it wouldn't it be great if we could just rely on the latest version always being available, because then we wouldn't have to worry about keeping track of you know, which thing depends on which other thing. And having already made that decision that that's not the way we're going to do it, it, it made it a lot easier to just say, well, that's a problem we don't need to solve because we've already solved it. We've got the strategy in place, and we're just going to carry on with it. And in the end, it worked out, it worked out well. I think if we, if we hadn't done that and we sort of left it open, there's a lot, of, a lot more things that I can see would have gone wrong along the way. We, we haven't decided whether we want to have versioned uh, uh, artifacts or just assume latest is always right, and we would have had to deal with it this, at some point. The next big one is to avoid breaking changes. When you've got a monolithic code base and you want to go and change this class to look like that class, you can you know, click on your IDE and click refactor, and two minutes later it's done, and everything's working with this new version, and you don't have to worry about it. When you've got microservices, uh, if you do that, everyone else's microservice is just going to break. And e even with a good versioning strategy, you still need to try and, you know, how do you get people from version A to version B without everything going down for five minutes while you move everything across? So breaking changes as a rule, I would say generally avoid. When you have to do them, think very carefully about what the migration path is and how, how you're gonna get from point A to point B. Um, yeah, that's something that you just don't think about within a monolith. The next one that sort of caught us a bit by surprise is how many tools we ended up writing. <clears throat> and I think this is particularly around moving from a monolith to microservices. It's not, if you're starting from scratch with microservices, you can just stick it in Kubernetes and it's fine. When you're moving from a monolith, you can't expect everybody to suddenly know how Kubernetes works and, and write their, their YAML files accordingly what we found we needed to do was write tools to, to get people to that point. So first step is um, you don't have to worry about how it's going to get in, into Kubernetes. When you click build, all these magic tools that I've written here will just kick into place and generate your YAML files from this tiny bit of config you put in place. Um, two months later, somebody wants to do something that doesn't quite fit into that bit of config you've assumed. And at that point, you need to say, well, those tools don't work anymore. Now I'm going to write some new tools that give you a bit more power, but still don't mean you have to go and learn the intricacies of Kubernetes DNS. Obviously, in the end, you don't want to be managing any of that, any of that stuff. You want each team to own their own code, deployments, everything. But to get to that point, you end up just writing and rewriting a lot of tools. The other big one was to, to pick your battles. The database is the perfect example. We could have gone in from the start and said, well, let's deal with the hard problem first. If we can solve that, we can solve anything, and still be trying to figure out how to untangle stored procs. Um, where, we've, where we've got traction on the way is where we've said, well, that problem is difficult. Let's just leave it till later and come back to it. Let's deal with these easy problems first and by the time we get to that big problem, it's not difficult anymore because all the pieces that were, were blocking it have now been solved. And I think the biggest, the biggest challenge for us was culture change. Um, this isn't about corporate mindset or anything. It's how do you get developers to start thinking about microservices and not about a monolith? The developers tend to be focused on what's the next business feature. Um, to having to understand how Kubernetes works and what Docker is, um, it, it's a big mind shift to, to have to think about that and you know, all the other stuff that goes with it, the breaking changes, thinking about versioning, 
pretty much everything I've gone through so far is different from the way you do it in, in a monolith. And culture change isn't something that, that, that happens overnight. Um, if we could have changed all the developers' mindset in an instant, I think this whole lot would have taken you know, three, min uh, th three months, not three years. Going back to my first, first slide, microservices are easy. It turns out they're not. They really are quite hard to get right. And looking back on it, one of the first questions we should have asked is, are we actually going to benefit from this? There's a lot of benefits to microservices, but there's a lot of costs and difficulties along the way as well. Is it really what we need for our problems? It turns out it was, so it's a good thing we did it. But it wasn't... <laughs> It wasn't a question we asked up front, and uh, I think it's probably a question that we should have. So where we are now is 60 microservices or so, a range of different languages, 60 node Kubernetes cluster hosted on-premises. Uh, the cluster itself is, is deployed through an automated script that, that runs on a regular schedule without any human interaction, so Kubernetes just is self-maintaining from that perspective. Um, a separate cluster for production, um, and all of that powered in the back by GitLab. We've gone from, I think it was five fairly large teams that knew how to do monoliths to, I can't remember what the last count was, I think 20 small teams, each focused on a couple of applications doing microservices. So the conclusion, to sum this up, is microservices are hard, don't underestimate them. Be prepared for a bumpy ride along the way. There's gonna be a lot of things that go wrong, things that go right, and pick the battles one at a time. Don't try to solve the hard problems first. To distract from any difficult questions, here's a nice little comic to explain continuous deployment. That means questions are, are permitted now. <laughs> Mike, moving. Hi. Uh, with respect to the Kubernetes deployments, have you started looking at service catalogs yet to, for your deployment? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch the last bit. It started uh, have you looking started at? looking at service catalogs, like the Ansible uh, deployment bundles or template type service uh, catalog? For Kubernetes itself? Yeah. Yeah, um, we do actually use Kubespray, which is uh, essentially that. It's an Ansible playbook written by, I don't know if it's actually an officially sanctioned Kubernetes thing or if it's just by the same people, but it's, um, that's, the, uh, th that's the core of, of how we actually do the deployment. Is there So I know one of the lessons learned was pick your battles, and uh, you decided not to pick the battle with the databases, but um, I still have to ask, have you ever considered something like a resource as a service model for, um, for your stateful databases, like your message queue um, your database, something yeah, like the, Open Broker API? Yeah, so, so the problem isn't what it should look like when it's finished, it's how to get there. Mm. Um, we, we've looked at the database and sort of thought how, how it could be better designed or how it could be split up or, you know, using... Uh, we do use message queues for other applications, but... Mm. Um, and the problem always is we don't really understand everything this database is doing. How do we... How can we actually get to the point where it's a whole lot of small databases? How does your, how does your API in front of your databases look now? What does it do? Um, so th that's quite a, quite a complicated uh, question. Definitely. At the moment, we've got um, several microservices in front of several parts of the database, sort of in the way we would like to break it up. So if you want to, if you want to do something with accounts, for example, you call the accounts API, you don't go to the bit of the database that deals with accounts. 
cool. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I was thinking, you said you should really think hard before kind of switching to microservices and the advantages that will bring to your company or your team or your project. Um, so looking back now that you've changed over to microservices, what are the real advantages looking back that you think are now <laughs> addressed? Um, so the biggest thing is how quickly and easily we can scale. Um, I had on that previous slide that we've got 60 microservices, well, 60 plus microservices, because I can't keep track. Every couple of days there's a new one popping up. And uh, I mean, that's just on the tech side. The teams also, I, I don't know how many teams we've got because they keep growing. Um, as soon as there's a new little feature that needs to be done, we just have another team that does it. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is it's, we couldn't have done that with a monolith. We would have had to think very carefully about, about how we're going to bring in this new feature because it's got to tie into everything else. Um, so is that and, and obviously the pace at which we can do it. Um, so one of the advantages of a monolith is you can have common libraries internal for things like logging, metrics extraction, error reporting, crash handling. As you go to a microservice architecture, if you're working on a microservice, do you, have you made your engineers do that themselves or are you trying to provide a base to extend from? Yeah. <clears throat> so this is, this is part of the, I suppose in a way, the, the migration path we took. Um, we started out with all of that stuff anyway because it was in the monolith. Um, where we went was to split that out into initially one big common library and we're now still in the process of trying to break it up into a lot of smaller libraries. Um, where we've gone with new languages and we didn't have any libraries before, there are still some things that I think are worth being common libraries, but they are minimal. Um, the bit that does the logging, um, we have a fairly strict structure that's absorbed by the um, we use gray log and it, it has a, you know, it, it expects the logs in a certain format. So we've got a library that makes sure that the logs that are outputted are in that format. But I think the trick is first of all to be very cautious about what goes into those common libraries and secondly to treat them the same way you would an open source library. It should be something that is um, independent of what's using it. It's just a library that people can installed through whatever appropriate um, package managers used and have available. And if it doesn't work, then they don't need to use it. They can do it themselves. I think that's the key thing. Uh, one more question. Um, you mentioned how you've separated your production um, Kubernetes cluster, but how everything is managed by GitLab. Um, how does that unpack because um, I think one of my concerns, I've looked into GitLab, but I'm like, do I want GitLab to have access to production Kubernetes? And yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I know exactly what you're asking because it was a problem for quite a while. <laughs> um, so, so GitLab doesn't have great uh, sort of security controls around production. Um, We've, we've, this is one of the places we've got bits of custom tooling that help deal with that. We've also, um, that's part of the reason for having a completely separate cluster in a separate network zone with a separate GitLab runner inside that zone that only has access to certain projects. Those are the only projects that can actually do the deployment part of the pipeline. And we then use things like the GitLab triggers to, when we get to that point, that bit of the project can be deployed. The other thing is we, we're not doing continuous deployment, we're doing continuous delivery. So if the, the final step of actually deploying, that's got to be manual anyway. Somebody's got to say, yes, this thing is now going, which means that if that step happens in a separate job that's sort of more tightly locked down, that's okay. Cool, thanks very much, David. Um, before everyone goes on break, just a quick announcement. So Luno is giving everyone 20 rands worth of Bitcoin.
So if you're not in on the game, you're about to be in on the game. Um, just huddle, right? <laughs> um, cool. So you can uh, to access.